While AAA studios create the games that are usually the face of the industry, they are by no means the only ones creating memorable video games. The independent game scene has been around since the dawn of the industry itself, but has made a huge resurgence in recent years thanks to console manufacturers and small publishers giving talented artists, programmers, and storytellers the support they need to get their projects off the ground. While they might not have the budget or tech of the big studios, the one advantage indie studios have over the AAA market is the freedom to create passion projects of sorts, not having to answer to higher-ups or shareholders who demand a certain product to reach a specific audience. Games like Inside, Cuphead, A Hat in Time, Pillars of Eternity, Papers, Please, or The Witness are all games that vary in genre and dabble in experimental gameplay or storytelling rarely seen in AAA games. One of the standout indie titles of the last decade or so was created by a Canadian team that took their small game jam entry into one of the best games in recent memory. That game is Celeste. On the surface, Celeste appears to be your traditional indie pixel 2D platformer and for the most part you'd be right, but looks can be deceiving as Celeste sets itself apart from its contemporaries in interesting ways. Celeste stars a young girl named Madeline as she tries to ascend Celeste Mountain. We'll get to the plot and characters in a little bit, but for now let's tackle Celeste's gameplay first. One of the things I admire about Celeste is how simple its mechanics are to pick up and master. Celeste's gameplay mechanics can be boiled down to three abilities, jump, grab, and dash. Jumping feels great with just the right amount of momentum and weight to feel in control but not too floaty. Grabbing walls and ledges is as easy as holding down the trigger. Madeline can only hang on for so long until her stamina runs out and she loses her grip. She can also perform a bit of a wall jump as well, kicking off in the opposite direction as to not waste stamina climbing. But the most versatile of these moves is Madeline's air dash ability. The player can air dash in any direction which is used for all manners of traversal, most importantly to avoid falling to one's death. Stringing together these simple mechanics is the core of Celeste's gameplay, and it's incredibly addicting. With those three simple mechanics, Matt Thorson and company were able to create compelling and challenging gameplay through its level design and gimmicks. Although it might share some similarities to simpler platformers like Mario on the surface, it's by no means an easy game. Far from it, in fact. A more apt comparison would have to be Edmund McMillan's Super Meat Boy, a game stuffed to the brim with platforming challenges. Celeste is broken up into several levels, depicting different sections of the mountain as Madeline climbs upward. Each level has its own unique theme and gimmick from the Celestial Hotel's black goo that leads to instant death upon touching it, or the Mirror Palace's light mechanic. Levels aren't constrained to just one central gimmick though, and as you progress, new mechanics are added to the mix, ensuring no level stagnates. For example, Golden Ridge introduces directional blocks that move on their own and can be manipulated, blue and pink clouds that can bounce players up using momentum constantly or for a single use respectively, blue bubbles that propel the player in whatever direction they wish, and ever-changing wind that can blow at various speeds and directions. That's just one level, and this design principle extends to each of the seven levels Celeste has. One of my favorite levels in the game from both a gameplay and storytelling standpoint is the aforementioned Celestial Hotel. The old resort is the base for a great little side story into the mind of its owner, and it's when the game starts to really ramp up its difficulty. The hotel is run by the ghost of its former owner, Mr. Oshiro. From the looks of it, you can tell the hotel hasn't been in service for quite some time, Mr. Oshiro even noting that he's excited that two guests have come to stay when Theo and Madeline pass through. The level design here is awesome, employing a variety of gimmicks like descending platforms and the previously mentioned black goo. These sentient death globs are the manifestation of Mr. Oshiro's schizophrenia, which is exacerbated by the stress of running a failing hotel. This level also has a bit of player choice, as halfway through, players have three separate paths they can complete in whatever order they choose. This is tied into cleaning up the hotel for Mr. Oshiro in an endearing exchange between him and Madeline. <laughs> The level ends in a timing-based boss battle of sorts, having to run away from the irate Mr. Yoshiro as he relentlessly hunts down Madeline. The Celestial Hotel is a bit of a microcosm of Celeste as a whole. Its level design forces players to be perfect with their jumps and dashes. The storytelling is personal and sympathetic, depicting a man trying his best to salvage a hotel that's lost to time. It's a combination of great characterization and challenging gameplay that's at the heart of Celeste. Like any platformer worth its salt, Celeste has collectibles players can go after in the form of strawberries and cassette tapes. Strawberries are rather hidden away in an optional room somewhere, or out in the open on the path through a level. They're not easily obtainable though, as they're placed in areas that demand perfect platforming and dashing in order to grab them. The kicker is you can't just cheese them by dashing into one just before you fall to your doom. More strawberries have you make it out of the room or land on solid ground long enough to collect it. While collecting them changes the ending very slightly, there's no actual reason to collect them as they don't earn you anything tangible in game. I see strawberries as more of an extra challenge, a personal challenge. Seeing that strawberry and going, yeah I can do that, and then trying and trying and trying. Collecting them is a reward enough 
enough since it's more of a test of ability rather than some arbitrary collectible. The other collectible players can find would be cassette tapes. Cassettes present more challenging platforming sections similar to strawberries. Unlike strawberries, tapes actually reward the player with something, reward being a very loose term. These outdated audio mediums activate a second, somehow more difficult version of the level they're found in for the masochists out there. Cassettes require more exploration, which makes finding one a treat and collecting one even sweeter. These side B variants on levels are no joke and will test your platforming ability and your sanity, and if you're up to the challenge, victory is reward enough at the end of the day. The great mixture of level design and gimmicks provides an adventure that's always doing something new just when the player is settling into a rhythm. It's expertly implemented and keeps Celeste fresh, always offering the player a new challenge to overcome. Each screen offers an almost puzzle of sorts, trying to figure out timing, the correct pattern through a section, or which combination of jumping, grabbing, climbing, and dashing are needed to make it to the end. Needless to say, Celeste can be crushingly difficult at times. That's not to say it's not enjoyable, though. Way back in my Tropical Freeze video, I mentioned that the enjoyment of completing a level is overcoming the challenging platforming. The feeling of accomplishment in pulling off some, dare I say, ridiculous jumps and dashes is euphoric, especially when taking into account the amount of times you'll try and fail. In Celeste, failure isn't a bad thing. Its level design encourages experimentation, and trial and error is the core concept of each level. Celeste's level consists of trying to piece together exactly what needs to be done to get to the end, and then needing to perfect that. Fair warning, you will die, and die, and die, and die throughout your ascent up Celeste Mountain. The reason why the trial and error style platforming works is because load times between death and spawn are nearly non-existent. This is key in keeping the flow of the game going. If load times were of traditional platformers, where you die, a little animation plays, fade to black, maybe a life counter or something like that shows up, and is back to the checkpoint, that would be frustrating with Celeste's design. I'm not ashamed to admit that I've compiled ridiculous death counts on some levels, sometimes upwards of over 200. That sounds like it would be frustrating and as a result just no fun, but it isn't. Celeste harnesses that just one more try mentality that can be addicting. Not wanting to let the game beat you, not wanting to give up even if it might seem impossible at times. This design philosophy plays perfectly into Celeste's story, characters, and themes. Celeste takes a rare look into the world of mental health through the main character, Madeline. Madeline suffers from a variety of everyday ailments people suffer from, whether that be low self-esteem, anxiety, depression, or panic attacks. These are shown and told throughout Madeline's journey through both direct and subtle ways. Madeline usually confides in people like her mother through phone calls about how she's not doing too well, or Theo, a hiker Madeline comes across on her journey. Theo helps Madeline continue to be positive throughout the game with his laid-back attitude. Then there's Madeline's other half, which is the dark version of herself. Some games have doppelgangers similar to this, an example being something like Dark Link from The Legend of Zelda or Dark Samus from Metroid Prime. They're usually bare-bones evil types that are just the dark version of the hero with very little in the way of meaning. Madeline's reflection is clearly her mental health disorders manifested as she tries her hardest to urge Madeline to just give up and go home, and when Madeline refuses, actively pursuing her and trying to get her to stop. Madeline's interaction with her reflection are the heart of Celeste and elevates it from a tough but fair platformer to an honest-to-goodness work of art. Much like Ninja Theory's Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice before, for it, the way its gameplay personifies its themes does an excellent job of putting the player in the mindset of Madeline. The frustration certain platforming sections can cause, the ups and downs of trying and failing, the sense of hopelessness from feeling like you can't progress, the moments of panic the pinpoint precision jumps or dashes cause. While it's not a perfect representation of what it's actually like to suffer from these mental disorders, it's a valiant effort that handles a very sensitive subject with style and grace. On the subject of style, Celeste's visual presentation employs a very minimalistic direction. Its pixel art is very much up to interpretation, but the animation is well done with a flow and movement that makes it look beautiful in motion. It's got this mix between an Atari game and an NES game, and it's unique to say the least. Accompanying the pixel style is more traditional art for character portraits and chapter cards. These are beautifully hand-drawn and charming. The amount of emotion that is portrayed, whether that's sarcastic quips or panic and distress, is not only impressive but key to selling these characters as real to us, especially Madeline. Madeline is such a dynamic character. She's sassy, she's understanding, she's sympathetic, she's determined, she's terrified. There's so much going on with Madeline throughout the journey, it's why the game's theme works so well. You'll find yourself relating to Madeline and sympathizing with her as she not only battles through the challenges of the mountain, but also with herself. Watching her confront her illness head on and eventually learning to live with it and not run away or fight it, it's some real powerful stuff. Strong enough to identify with and help people come to grips with something that's so abstract and difficult to understand sometimes. It's no wonder Celeste won the game award for Games for Impact. <laughs>
Sometimes games have a singular focus, story and themes over gameplay or vice versa, and for indie titles, balancing those aspects can be difficult due to the simple fact they just don't have the resources that higher profile developers have. But Celeste is a beautiful marriage of a strong theme, great characters, and tough but fair gameplay that always delights whether that's overcoming a tricky level or caring for and sympathizing with a character who suffers from mental illness. To choose to tackle such a sensitive subject as mental illness through a medium primarily focused on distracting us from said mental illness is commendable to say the least. The maturity and grace it's handled with is what elevates Celeste's depiction over other attempts in the past. Celeste left an impact on gaming, whether that's how we view mental illness or how its themes and gameplay can be merged into one singular experience. Celeste might not be a blockbuster experience that'll push console sales, and it doesn't have to be. It stands on its own as a wonderful little gem worthy of its near universal praise. In an industry marred by soulless games stuffed to the brim with microtransactions, battle passes, and monetization schemes, Celeste exemplifies the very best of what video games can be. It's a testament to what a handful of people can do when they put their hearts and souls into a game.